Good morning, everyone. This is Hannah Deach from the Department of Education. Um, we will start our meeting probably in the next five minutes um, while other folks are logging in. We know there are several people who are uh, still joining the call. Um, this is this uh, Zoom interface, by the way, is for members of the uh, K-12 subgroup, um, and we keep the interface to uh, the K-12 subgroup members so that we can manage um, uh, audio and um, visual effectively. We are also um, streaming this meeting live on our YouTube link and I will post that to the, um, I will post that to the chat. So if you are not a member of the K-12 subgroup or you serve as a pro or if you are not serving as a proxy, I'd ask that you join us by the, um, link that I'm about to enter and public comment we can receive um, through two email addresses. So I will share that now. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. So we have the YouTube link here. I know some folks are having some difficulties with YouTube. We'll have those addressed momentarily. And I'm also sending emails for public comment. Let me give folks one or two more minutes. And then again, if you're on this line, if you're trying to enter the Zoom and you are not a member of the K-12 subgroup, I'm going to ask if you can please join us using the Zoom link that is in this invite. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, um, and uh, there we go. Thank you, Ryan um, Gremion. Are you on the line? Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead yeah, and get. Can you hear me? 
Yes, Ryan, I can hear you now. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just to give you a quick sense of our agenda for the day, um, we're uh, fortunate enough to be joined by some medical experts from the Department of Health and also from Children's Hospital. Um, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Leron Finger from Children's Hospital, and we have Dr. Frank Welch from our Louisiana Department of Health. We'll open the conversation today with some remarks from Dr. Welch and Dr. Finger about the status of the COVID-19 disease um, in Louisiana, what we know now versus a month ago about transmission, particularly among school-aged children, and um, the best and most realistic protective measures that schools can take um, as they plan to reopen in the academic year. We'll then walk through at a high level the public health guidelines and supportive guidance that I shared with you all on Friday and shared again this morning. That guidance has not changed um, from over the weekend. It was approved by our senior officials over the weekend. And then we'll spend some time talking about supports that the department um, in collaboration with Children's Hospital and others will be able to provide to school systems. And um, we'll seek your feedback on some school system planning items as well. Um, so that is the general shape for our meeting today. Um, but before we actually started officially, I would like Brian, if you could, to please, um, if you could call roll. And also, there have been some questions coming up about quorum and certification for quorum. Um, Ryan, if you could just sort of explain to the group our um, quorum requirements, that would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Anadish is here. Uh, Ken Bradford. Present. Uh, David Alexander. Here. Um, Larry Carter. Here. Uh, Preston Castillo. Here. Uh, Patrick Dobart. Here. Ashley Ellis. Here. Michael Falk. I'm uh, present and I would like to uh, state two objections to this meeting. Number one, school systems across the state have been required to change their meeting requirements in order to have a quorum. And I think that we may be uh, stepping on some legal issues. And number two, I think it's ludicrous to think that we should vote on something that we had short opportunity to review. There are serious concerns about what is required, what is mandated, and what is a guideline. We were given the impression that the state was going to release something on June 22nd. But according to the calendar that you have, you're already doing surveys and you're already doing webinars. So I want to say I'm president, I'm present, but I will be removing myself from the meeting based on those objections. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Falk. Um, Patrick Jenkins. Present. Present. Linda Johnson. Present. Joanne Matthews. Here. Tia Mills, Dr. Tia Mills. Uh, Dana Peterson. Present. Caroline Roma. Present. Uh, Ava Dejois. And Dr. Kim Hunter Reed. Susanna Craig, proxy for Dr. Kim Hunter Reed. All right, so we have a quorum. I believe there's a question about um, open meetings law. Uh, as we understand it, this, this is a subgroup of a task force of a commission. Um, Therefore, the subgroup, to the extent that it isn't comprised of 50% plus one, 
of the task force members isn't required to adhere to, to public, public meetings law. Now, in our first meeting, we try to uh, submit our agendas to be posted to the RLC website. And we were told by the administrator of, of the RLC that since it was a subgroup, fewer than 50% of the task force it's attached to, which is in our case, the Education and Workforce Development Task Force. Since our subgroup is less than 50% of that task force, we're not subject to the public meetings laws. Uh, we verified this with our legal team, and uh, we feel as though we, we are doing, um, by posting these meetings, we're doing more than we're actually legally obligated to, to be doing. Um, I can see the confusion here, but uh, like I said, the task force, is subject to open meetings laws. The overarching RLC is subject to open meetings laws, but a subgroup of a task force of the commission is not subject to it. And as I understand it, the RLC and the task forces are also meeting virtually as well. So we're sort of taking our lead from the RLC and the individual task forces as well. So I think we're, we're Legally speaking, we're adhering to the, the letter and intent of open meetings laws. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. Is there a need to read the certification for lack of quorum statement, Ryan, in light of that? Um, sure, we can read it. It's attached to the agenda, but we can read through it anyways. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So I'll read this out. In accordance with Executive Proclamation JBE 2020-75, issued by Governor John Bell Edwards on June 4th, 2020, the Resilient Louisiana Commission is providing for attendance at essential commission and task force meetings via teleconference or video conference as allowed during the pendency of the COVID-19 health emergency. Pursuant to Section 2C of JBE 2020-75, the RLC Education Workforce Task Force K-12 education subgroup will provide for attendance at its 12 p.m. meeting on Monday, June 15th via Zoom and in a manner that allows for observation and input by members of the public as set forth in the notice posted on June 10th, 2020. The Education Workforce Task, Task Force K-12 education subgroup would otherwise be unable to operate due to quorum requirements. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Mike, I understand um, your concerns about timeline. I think it's fair to say that we are working as quickly as we can to get guidance in the hands of school systems so that they can begin planning for the opening of the academic year. We will have, um, we're trying to build in ample opportunity for discussion. That said, if this group chooses not to receive and refer the guidance to the Education and Workforce Development Task Force, that's certainly the group's prerogative, it's not mine. Um, our role really is to work closely with the public health experts of the state to develop um, guidelines, high level guidelines um, for school systems to use as they think about how to reopen schools. We present them to this committee. The Education and Workforce Development Task Force includes those recommendations in their report and they go to the Resilient Louisiana Commission. Um, so again, it, if, the, if it is the wish of this group to hold the uh, guidelines, certainly that is the group's prerogative. Um, before we dive into the agenda, um, I am getting a note that the YouTube link is, um, we're still working to get that up. Actually, let me just text and see. Um, Yep. Um, we're still working to get the YouTube link um, working. So we have many more people on this call than are actually subgroup members or proxies. I'm just going to leave y'all on um, and you should feel free to listen in. I would just ask that you keep yourself on mute to keep the volume down and to allow the K-12 um, subgroup members uh, time to ask questions and so on. And if you have public comment, please feel free to send that in uh, to Ryan Grimion. Um Okay. So we're going to move ahead and um, hear first uh, an update from Dr. Welsh and Dr. Finger, the medical experts on the line with us. Uh, our, the public health work group that develops the recommendations that are before you, we're fortunate enough to hear from 
um, these experts to uh, more or less understand current state of the disease here in Louisiana, but what we know from current research, which in this um, dynamic we know is changing almost daily. So I'm very pleased to offer the floor for a few moments to Dr. Welsh and Dr. Finger, and then we will have time for Q&A from them before we go into uh, the guidelines themselves. So thank you, Hannah. This is Leron Finger at Children's Hospital in New Orleans. I just wanted to thank the committee for inviting us to participate. It's an honor to participate in the planning uh, to see how we can safely get our kids back in school and what education looks like for the upcoming fall semester. So I just wanted to thank you for including us in this planning process. As everyone on the call knows, COVID-19 strikes children at a much lesser degree than it does the adult population. So I won't go over all of that data you've seen in the news over the last three months. But what I would like to share is some of our data from the state of Louisiana. Our current numbers include just over 1,670 cases reported in children under the age of 18 in the state of Louisiana, including two deaths from the disease. That accounts for about 3% of total cases in the entire state. Uh, out of all of those children who have tested positive, a small minority end up needing to be admitted to the hospital for COVID-19 disease, and an even smaller percentage, about 5 to 10% of children, need ICU care. So although children are struck to a much lesser severity than adults, some of them, a very few number, still do get sick. That being said, there's still lots about this disease that we don't understand. Um, but what we've done over the last several weeks is take what we've learned over the first three months of planning for this disease in healthcare settings and try and apply the, what we've learned and these guidelines to you as you try and return to education in the upcoming fall semester. Early on in the pandemic, I was able to speak with my colleagues in Seattle and New York who are both several weeks ahead of us in the disease and take the lessons that they learned and apply them in real time here in New Orleans and across the entire LCMC system and share those lessons with my pediatric colleagues across the state of Louisiana. I think that has been invaluable in us being able to jump up to where those places were several weeks ahead of us in the pandemic and able to take care of our patients, our families, and also our team members in the time of this global disease. So as we collaborated with the Department of Education on this project, I believe that my role is to help you translate recommendations and guidelines and mandates that come from the federal authorities into helping your team and you understand how to do the right thing for children, get them back in schools, keep them safe, and keep all the team members, educators, all the other workers at the schools safe and in a safe and effective fashion. So I'm happy to answer questions. I think Dr. Welsh is gonna do a little bit of an introduction about where we are elsewhere in the state with regards to this disease. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Hannah, could you just give me a thumbs up? You can hear me? There we go, excellent. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Frank Welch. I've presented to you multiple times before. I just wanted to give you a little update on things, on how things have changed for the state of Louisiana over the past three months and how that may affect us in the K-12 school year uh, coming up next year. So um, uh, many things that started in, during this pandemic, including testing, have now changed. Everyone remembers initially testing was very hard to get. It was very confusing. Fortunately, the state of Louisiana has expanded our testing capability by more than 50 fold. Now, testing for COVID-19 is relatively widely available. That really changes the landscape for, for how we manage, how we treat, and how we understand this disease. Um, in addition to that, the state of Louisiana has implemented, and many people have read about it, uh, case identification and contact tracing. And what that means is when someone is identified to be a case of COVID-19, they are told to isolate at home and they have certain criteria that they need to follow until they are better, until they can return back to either work or school. However, as part of this as well, we want to know who has been in contact with that particular person, the case, up until two days before they actually became ill, up until the time we got that positive test. And depending on how much contact these people have had with that particular case, there may be a process called quarantine due to case identification. 
Say, for example, if a child is identified to have COVID-19 in a school system and they have been in close contact with several other children, and what I mean by close contact is more than 15 minutes and less than six feet apart, some of those other children may be asked to stay home for up to a period of 14 days and monitor symptoms. This is an overall process that's happening throughout the state for every single case of coronavirus, not just school children, but again, it's a process in order to slow the spread so that the healthcare community can keep up and eventually, hopefully, find a vaccine or effective treatments. So um, we have started our contact case identification and contact tracing process. We feel that this is going to significantly alter the course of disease, making sure that those people who have the disease stay home and making sure that their close contacts stay home and stay isolated to see if they have the disease as well. So, we, uh, and just finally, as I mentioned on Friday, the state of Louisiana is doing very well. Our citizens have, have paid good attention to our recommendations. Um, our, our rates of disease increase are not like those we have seen in other places, and, and we feel very pleased with that. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Welch and Dr. Finger. Um, Dr. Welch and Dr. Finger have been integral in developing the guidelines and guidance that are before you, and also have, have been working with other states um, to develop their guidance. And I was wondering if either or both of you could provide any perspective you have on the shape of our guidance, how it compares to other states, how it compares to the federal guidelines, um, just so that the folks in this work group are able to get um, are able to get a, a feel for where our guidance falls in terms of prescriptiveness, a level of detail and so on as it relates to other states or even the federal guidelines. Frank, you wanna go first? We can't hear you, Frank, you're on mute. No. I'll go yeah, ahead and there, now we can. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. There we go, there we go. So um, I have reviewed other states' guidance. Now, as uh, you can imagine, some other states are, are um, a little less prescriptive and others are far more prescriptive than, than we are. Um, I, I think it, we have to del uh, you know, walk a fine line between how we protect children in terms of their health and how we make sure that the spread of this disease is, is muted and, and we limit contact between children in order to limit spread of disease, but also recognize how valuable the school environment is and, and getting kids back to school and making sure that not just the learning environment is important, but also the, also the other services and, and um, things that children get while they're at school during the day, structure, food, all kinds of things uh, are important as well. So the guidance that we've developed really has been a balance between um, where we were before in phase zero, which was uh, you know, instruction at home, and reopening the school environment and trying to do that in a, in a way that is not only safe, but recognizes the importance of the school environment as well. Dr. Finger? Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think, um, again, what we've tried to do is take guidance and make it translate that into things that are actually workable and operational in a variety of settings and environments and physical spaces that differ across the state and also can taking into consideration that the penetrance of COVID-19 disease is not uniform across the state. So inherently we've included some flexibility of these guidelines for the leadership on the ground to be able to make decisions that match with the disease burden in their own local areas. I think that's completely reasonable um, and it's okay to have guidance that allows some of that um, shared governance to occur. I think that's very reasonable. The other thing I'd like to say is that these are the guidelines that we've developed with now. They're certainly subject to change as we gain more information we're 90 days into this pandemic in the United States, and we've learned a lot already, even though we're only that short of time into it. As we learn more over the upcoming months, I think we should feel free to adjust on the fly with informed information to make those adjustments that make sense. Again, with the goal of keeping our students and our team members safe and up to date. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Um, just to get that perspective. Um, I would invite um, members of the K-12 task force, if you are on the line, 
either um, through our chat function or if you'd like to take yourself off mute, members of the K-12 subgroup, if you have contextual sort of global questions for Dr. Welsh or Dr. Finger, I'd like to spend a few minutes on that now. Then we'll go into discussion of the guidelines um, themselves. Um, and I imagine that there will be several questions that come up as we move sort of row by row through those guidelines. But are there any sort of overarching uh, questions that you have for Dr. Welsh or Dr. Finger for those in the subgroup? And this is Preston Castillo. Just um, there was reference to the impact of children, and, and that there's been lots of discussion about how children are impacted by the, the virus. Uh, would you mind just sharing with us, uh, for those who hadn't been tracking that very well, what is the current uh, thinking as it relates to our data, as it relates to how children are impacted? Uh, I guess from a, a general perspective, there's a lot going on about whether kids are impacted, whether they will become symptomatic, whether they will get sick, whether they're carriers. Uh, would you mind sharing kind of what is the latest thinking a little bit more, please? Sure, I can take that first, Frank, and then you can fill in. I think as far as the disease burden goes in children, the, va uh, the vast majority of children who get infected with this disease will not get severely sick, Preston. I think that's the certainly data that's borne itself out here and in, in Western Europe for sure. I think the data we have from China is pr probably less, um, maybe we don't have as much credence as we can put into that data. So that's from North America and Western Europe. Um, it does not appear that um, kids with underlying illnesses are more severely affected than the general population, which I think we were concerned about uh, in the early stages of this pandemic. That has not borne itself out. Nevertheless, our recommendations for children who do have chronic diseases is still to treat, you know, isolate yourself as much as possible um, in the face of this pandemic. Um, as far as the contagiousness question, which I think you also asked for, sort of how contagious is this for kids? We're still in the early stages of sorting that out. I think the initial um, news on this sort of for the first four to six weeks in March and April, at least locally here in the United States, was discussion that children are sort of asymptomatic vectors of this disease. You've probably all seen that in the news. We don't have a lot of hard scientific data to support that. And I think as Dr. Welch and I have discussed along with members of the Office of Public Health, we're, we're not sure if that is actually gonna bear itself out to be true necessarily. That doesn't mean that children cannot spread the disease to others, but it's probably not at the end of the day gonna be the leading store that kids are the folks who spread this across the globe unwittingly. I think I answered most of what you were asking, Mr. Castile. Is that sort of what you got? And I understand that I'm not giving an exact answer, but I'm telling you that's the news sort of as we have it, as up to the date as we can do it. Great. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Frank, anything else to add or did I get it all? You got it all. Nothing to add. Thank you. Any other uh, global or contextual questions from the K-12 subgroup members? Hannah, Hannah this is Dana Peterson, uh, Department of Education. Um, Dr. Fink, uh, uh, Finger and Dr. Welch, I have a question. I notice in the um, in the guidance we are we are saying to discontinue off-site field trips. Um, some school systems uh, send ki high school kids, in particular off-site um, for, for learning opportunities. So I'm thinking in New Orleans and in Baton Rouge specifically, there are centralized uh, career centers where kids go and get, uh, get, get, uh, get learning. They would go to that, that place regularly throughout the week. In phase three, are we, are we saying that type of activity also, also should be discontinued or how could we make that safer? You know, I think we made that recommendation, Mr. Peterson, sort of in an effort to control the environment of the learners as much as possible with the information that we have now. 
I think I'll defer to Han and the other lead educators on this group, but I think what you described, I would probably not in my mind contextualize as a field trip necessarily and a necessary part of their learning uh, environment. So, I, you know, a trip to the Children's Museum, I would say maybe shouldn't happen at this time. What you described, I would give a robust thumbs up. Certain restrictions in place. These restrictions are mandated by the Louisiana Department of Health. Next paragraph, Louisiana Department of Education consultation with the Louisiana Department of Health offers the supportive guidance in order to sit and assist mm -hmm. schools. So there's yeah. things that we read that are not, they kind of get tangled up between what's considered a, a restriction that's mandated versus what's guided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, thanks. We've had a robust discussion about this um, throughout, you know, since we started developing the summer guidance this spring. I think it's a very important point. Uh, when we finalize these documents, what we will do is link to the guidance memo, or sorry, the guidelines, the public health memo. The public health memo embodies the true requirements that public health is asking of K-12 school systems, and we will link to that. The supportive guidance is labeled as such, and if there's anything that we can do to further clarify that, David, let's just work offline on language that you think or placement of language that you think would be beneficial. But I agree, it's important to clarify what is supportive implementation guidance versus what is um, really truly uh, expected. Okay, I'd, li I'd like to move now into um, SEMS was developed just very briefly and then talk through the top line um, expectations um, that are articulated in the, in the memo. Um, and then we'll have some time to talk through uh, supports that will be able to that will be available for school systems as well. Um, so here on this slide, you'll see sort of more or less the process that any body of guidance about reopening um, schools um, follows, um, and this is roughly parallel to the um, approach that we use to release summer school and summer camp guidance. We consulted with a superintendent advisory group of which superintendent. Tenant Jenkins and Superintendent Alexander were apart. We met several times over the past um, month, more or less, to discuss um, health and feasibility concerns, to provide time for discussion with public health officials and so on. Um, I think we had robust, it's fair to characterize those conversations as robust. And um, you know, I will not, of course, we did not agree on, on every ultimate recommendation, but we've um, been grateful to hear from this group of superintendents and shaping the guidance. Uh, next, we've deliberated with a public health response team that includes uh, you know, 20 individuals from our Department of Health, um, from uh, LSU's epidemiology department, um, representatives from the Department of Education, from the Board of Regents, um, and also uh, representatives from, uh, at different times, the LHSAA. So this is the sort of core team that says, look, Here's what we understand about COVID-19, its transmission in schools, and what we need as baseline measures to keep schools safe while operational, sort of as Dr. Finger described earlier. Once we have the um, state public health officials sign off on, the, on that guidance, which we now have, we bring it through the Resilient Louisiana Commission. And the Resilient Louisiana Commission considers guidance from across all of uh, the state's economic sectors relative to reopening, so from casinos to um, hair salons, to schools, to museums, the Resilient Louisiana Commission um, receives guidance from a number of sectors relative to how to reopen. Um, and as Ryan was describing earlier, we have this K-12 subgroup. There's also an early childhood subgroup. We report into uh, a task force that Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed and Secretary Dejwa lead and then they report um, into the Resilient Louisiana Commission. So that is sort of the path of the, of the guidance as it, as it moves forward. Um, to give you a sense of um, the resources in addition to the guidelines that we'll be um, sharing with school systems over the coming weeks, we have the memo from public health that includes the baseline public health expectations that school systems should be uh, thinking about trying to meet supportive guidance um, that uh, Superintendent Alexander, you were citing earlier that we shared over, uh, uh, that we shared on Friday as well. These are best practices, resources, links, tools for implementing the guidelines themselves. 
And then we'll be also producing a planning template and a checklist. Um, these are tools that are completely optional, but supportive tools for school systems to use in making determinations about how they will uh, open their school facilities to students this fall. We'll talk a little bit about some of the items on that template and checklist later in our conversation today, and we'd like your feedback on those. In terms of support for school systems, um, we have three webinars planned. We have an overview webinar planned for uh, Wednesday of this week. Um, this overview webinar is meant to provide global information about the guidelines and the guidance um, in advance of what could be a press conference later this week by the governor and his team. So we want to provide some overview before any official announcements of the guidance. And then we'll have detailed webinars on the 25th and the 30th once the guidance um, is final. So at least three webinars over the course of the next two weeks, more or less, with the one occurring on Wednesday as an overview and the ones occurring on the 25th and the 30th as more um, detailed opportunities to dive in depth. We're also very grateful to have um, uh, established a partnership with Children's Hospital of New Orleans. Um, later in this conversation, I'd like the folks from Children's to share more about these resources, but I wanna make sure we prioritize the guidance itself in, the, um, in our time today. But Children's Hospital will be staffing a hotline um, for school system leaders and educators to use if they have questions, particularly questions of a clinical or medical nature that would um, benefit from a nurse's advice. There will be a hotline open for school system uh, leaders and school leaders. And Children's Hospital also will be offering town hall webinars to our education field beginning in July every couple of weeks. Um, those webinar topics will include you know, transmission basics, as we heard from Dr. Welch and Dr. Finger today, um, prevention measures, sanitation best practices, um, and uh, other topics as needed. So we're very grateful to the folks at Children's for establishing this partnership with us. We'll have more time to discuss it later in the meeting today. I'd like to transition now to discussion of the guidelines themselves, which you have, I sent on Friday, I resent this morning, they have not changed. So these Department of Health guidelines are really the, um, the expectations that our Louisiana public health community has for schools as they reopen, sort of minimum safety thresholds, I think is one way of thinking about them. I'm going to voice these over very briefly um, and then open it up for questions and also any context from um, the medical professionals on, on this call. There are some key changes from the guidance that we issued around summer schools and summer camps, and I will flag those um, where they come up. And uh, my colleague, Ken Bradford, has really been um, leading this process in tandem with me. And uh, Ken, you should please feel free to chime in wherever helpful. So if you'll just bear with me, I'd like to spend the next three to four minutes really just walking through the key points that are contained within uh, the guidelines that you received on Friday and again this morning. In terms of achieving social distancing in school buildings, um, there are a few different considerations that are outlined within this memo. And the first consideration is around the maximum group size with, you'll see here, sizes starting at 10 in phase one, 25 in phase two, and 50 in phase three. Now, when we released the summer schools and summer camps guidance, the social distancing recommendation went on to say that though that if you are opening your facility to students, you must keep students in a static group of 10, 25, or 50. In other words, the same group of students needs to be together for the maximum duration possible. And the reason that this was the guidance that we offered is because at that time, there was um, a thought that, and there still is a thought, that um, young children in particular have a difficult time or really would not be reasonably able to maintain physical distance, which is another way of limiting the spread of the virus. And so the recommendation was keep students in static groups without physical distance recommendations uh, further, further, on, further in place. What you see now are two different ways, more or less, of achieving the social distancing expectation. First, for elementary or younger students, 
main, as we have had in place for summer schools and camps, maintaining static groups and with the understanding that within those static groups, children are more than likely uh, going to interact with each other, come into close contact with one another. Um, I have a, a rising kindergartner and a rising third grader. It is very difficult for me to imagine them in any uh, academic setting, sitting constantly six feet away, nor is that really instructionally what's indicated for students who are younger. So this is one way of achieving social distancing for younger children is through maintaining static groups. In other words, the same group of children are together for the maximum amount of time possible. But we know this would be very challenging, particularly in the secondary environment. And so our public health experts have offered the um, condition that for secondary grades, where you may have students who would be um, taking uh, different courses and needing to move to different teachers and just sort of number of different uh, schedules for a secondary uh, program, given, given those conditions, the opportunity to uh, change the group's composition, keeping the total size static or keeping the, so the total size the same, but enabling students to um, mix within uh, those groups. So essentially, if students are able to maintain physical distance, that, with, that students could, the composition of those groups could change so long as the number of students uh, stayed the same. I think that's an overly complicated way of saying that in the secondary environment, if you're able to have kids keeping more or less six feet of distance, you can change the composition of those groups so long as they stay at 10, 25, or 50. And that is a change from summer. I'm just going to move through the rest of these just very briefly. Uh, in terms of physical standards um, and environmental cleaning and personal hygiene, the one thing that was helpful, and I think Dr. Finger and Dr. Welsh, after we sort of get through this initial summary, it would be helpful to hear about this, is that one thing I was able to learn or we were able to learn from public health officials that there's somewhat less concern about uh, the cleanliness of surfaces. Um, and so we've, therefore in the guidance, you'll see that the expectations around cleaning surfaces are reduced from what you saw over the summer. Um, high touch surfaces uh, should be cleaned before and after each group's use, but there's no need to physically clean a classroom throughout multiple times in a day. Really the focus here is on cleaning high touch surfaces. Um, an obvious recommendation around limiting crowding at entry and exit points um, and uh, working to maintain maximum group sizes and physical distance recommendations at those entry and exit points. Um, and then I'm just going to skip down quickly because there are some other uh, related uh, provisions here. Uh, ensuring that high touch surfaces um, throughout the school, including bathrooms, are cleaned more or less multiple times per day. Um, that is more relaxed than what we saw for summer school and summer camps guidance. So shifting from cleaning those surfaces every hour to cleaning those sur surfaces after every group's use or multiple times per day. And that will depend on the intensity of the use in those different um, facilities in those different areas. Schools and school systems will decide. One um, shift also is around um, personal uh, hygiene um, and particularly the use of masks. So summer schools and summer camps uh, guidance um, indicated that any student above the age of two should be wearing a mask at all times. And you'll see here that our public health officials guided us to a recommendation uh, that uh, secondary students age, uh, age 10 or fifth grade and older really should be asked to wear masks to the maximum extent possible, and most importantly, at entry and exit um, and during transitions, with the building, uh, during transitions within the school building. I'd like, um, again, I will ask uh, Dr. Finger and Dr. Welsh to share a little bit more about that recommendation um, in a moment, but I wanted to just call out the fact that the age has gone from two to 10 in terms of mask usage in the school building. Uh, Couple other points um, on athletics. Um, LHSAA has developed uh, very detailed uh, guidelines for fall athletics. I think they're around 20 pages, and we will refer folks who have questions about athletics to that guidance. And Ken, I know you've been deeply involved with Mr. Bonine um, as he's developed that guidance. So we will um, we will link to that. In terms of symptom monitoring, 
Um, there's an expectation that as students come into the building, um, they're assessed for symptoms, most importantly, cough or shortness of breath, and also an initial temperature check. Um, schools are asked to have an area that can be used to isolate a student if they do become um, sick and to be able to clean that area after the student has gone home. We'll talk a little bit more about what happens after isolation and after that child goes home. Um, but one thing I want to be clear about that's come up in several settings is that schools and school systems are not responsible for contact tracing. Um, and they will work in concert with the state's team of public health um, contact tracers and also regional public health officers in order to address any uh, positive or presumptively positive um, cases of COVID-19 in their school building. Uh, there are some significant changes to the transportation guidance that I want to highlight for you first. When we issued guidance this spring, it was only for phase one of um, reopening. Here you'll see capacity guidelines for phases two and three. My understanding is that these derive from the statewide um, recommendations around public transit. So uh, running buses at 25, then 50, then 75% capacity. Um, and the guidance here mirrors the statewide guidance. Um, one big challenge associated with the transportation guidance for summer schools and camps was an expectation that there was a symptom check and temperature check before students boarded the bus. That is no longer here. Um, and instead, students will be checked as they come into the school building. And if they have symptoms, they will uh, be asked to isolate in a room set aside for that purpose. So no longer the expectation for a symptom and temperature check as students are boarding uh, is no longer here. Um, we've gotten several questions about how to achieve spacing within these capacity limits. Um, we don't prescribe a specific method for doing that except in phase one where you would be able at 25% capacity to ensure spacing between rows. In phases two and three with 50 and 75% uh, capacity limits, um, it will, how you achieve spacing will depend on how many family or household units you have on the bus, um, totaling to the um, percentage capacity. And um, that will be uh, more or less um, how you will achieve spacing, you will decide that based on sort of the composition of your bus. We're not prescribing a particular way to achieve that in phases two and three. I think those are the highlights of the guidelines themselves. The supportive guidance is um, uh, more detailed, includes sort of best practices, resources, links to, uh, for example, cleaning products that um, the CDC recommends. It includes links um, from, you know, bus companies about the best way to sanitize a bus while preserving the seat fabrics integrity and so on. I'm not gonna go through those in great detail because um, as Dr. Alexander noted earlier, they're not required that supportive guidance, but we're certainly happy to answer any questions about what's contained within at any time. But this slide just gives you a sense of um, what is contained in those uh, in the supportive guidance ranging from very, for more detailed um, best practices around transportation, also around food preparation and meal service, uh, approaches to managing entry and exit that could be helpful, but certainly are not required. I'd like to spend the most of our, the majority of our time answering questions about these uh, guidelines here. Before we go directly into questions though, I would ask Dr. Welsh and Dr. Finger, what am I missing? Is there any context you would add now that we're getting into the details? And I think some information particularly around surfaces and masks would, would benefit the group if you would be able to. Sure, I think you gave a great sort of overview at a high level with some delineation of some of the nuances of doing this uh, over a large state and in different environments. Um, I think the biggest points are that we use these words as much as possible because I think our goal was not to have educators become enforcers, but try and keeping kids and all your team members as safe as possible in an ever changing environment. That's one of the reasons we came up with the mask requirement that we did. Uh, remember, I started this out by saying our job is to interpret the guidelines and help translate them into things that are actually functional and operational. We, we thought it would be um, better and also it meets the sort of safety requirements to not require masks for those kids who are sort of younger than age 10. 
um, our infectious disease uh, team within pediatrics feels that that would just promote a lot of face touching and really wouldn't help to mitigate any potential spread as opposed to not requiring it for those kids during the day. I think when looking at high touch surfaces, I think what we're really looking at are doorknobs, um, entryways to restrooms, um, sort of cafeteria surfaces, but not necessarily, you know, um, scrubbing down every desk and book in between each and every class. I think the bang for your buck with that sort of effort is inconsequential or it is you're not going to get much out of that. But I think focusing on the real truly high touch that lots of hands are touching before kids have really had a chance to do adequate hand washing is really what you'll get your bang for your buck. And all of the early data shows that there, it seems like there's very little um, potential for true disease transmission in, from environmental surfaces. That being said, we don't know that with 100% certainty, which is why these requirements for disinfection on high touch surfaces still exist. Um, I see there's one question about masking on the chat. I think um, I, the recommendations were not um, quite that specific about how frequently kids need to change their masks. But since kids won't be necessarily wearing the surgical or hospital grade masks, and many of them will be wearing cloth pipe masks that can be laundered at home, I don't think it's reasonable or necessary, quite honestly, to require them to come in with a new mask every day. I think they can certainly, uh, but we did not discuss those specifics yet. So I'll defer answering that in, unless someone else had another thought. I have a question. Uh, this is Preston Castile again. Um, this is all very, very helpful. And thank you, Dr. Finger and Dr. Welch for your work and, and the team that's been putting all of this together. At two or three months ago, we were hearing that perhaps in the summer, the virus would die down with the warm weather, the humidity, uh, and then there might be a resurgence of some sort of the virus come fall or, or winter. So we're kind of seeing that now uh, occur uh, certainly with the guidance. Are you hearing anything or have any insight in terms of why, what we might be able to uh, expect uh, in the fall or winter? I, I know that's probably hard and maybe guessing, but you're the best we've got right now to, <laughs> to yeah. ask the question. I got you, Mr. Castile. It's a low bar for me to jump over, so I'll try and uh, answer what I can. I think, you know, it, it is an educated guess. I would say that. I, I would say that everyone within pediatric healthcare certainly has not exhaled sufficiently and completely yet. We're still moderately anxious about what might come in sort of fall and winter as our kids return to sort of communal learning environments. That being said, I think everyone understands the benefit that is obtained in an education environment that's not solely provided by remote learning and we all desperately want to see um, kids in the United States be able to return to that. And I think Louisiana has taken a relatively aggressive approach in saying, hey, how do we take these guidelines and make them as translatable as possible to all of you guys who oversee different environments with different penetrants of disease? So I think we do have a level of anxiety. We don't know, nothing that we recommend to you is going to be 100% perfect. And I think I say that to you, not to absolve myself of responsibility, but because that's the truth. We're still in the early phases of learning about this. But this is, I think, as good of a compendium of um, learning as we can put together at this time. So I think, you know, I don't know. I'm a little bit anxious and we might need to adjust on the fly, Mr. Castile. I don't know. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's someone on the line named uh, James Woodfolk. If you could please um, keep yourself on mute, that would be very helpful um, as we're picking up your background noise. Um, other questions from uh, the K-12 subgroup on the guidelines themselves. Um, I had a quick question on um, um, I'm sorry, could you speak up? We're having a hard time with your audio. I'm sorry, this is that's David. Okay. Yeah, that's better, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the slide that you just had up on, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just so for some clarity here, and I, look, I'm, I don't know how other people in the subgroup task force are, uh, where their brains are going with all of this. I'm trying to execute what I'm reading. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out, because I'm no healthcare professional. So Dr. Finger, Dr. Welch, if they say, you know, you've got to put your right hand on your head twice a day, then I'm going to figure out how do we do that. So, and, 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 and I'm not trying to be ridiculous. I'm just saying that from, I don't have any, you know, expertise that would, um, you know, that can give any sort of feedback around whether this is good guidance or bad guidance uh, from the standpoint of protecting public health. So my job now is to execute what you believe protects public health. And so there's a handful of little things. On this slide right here, you have the word elementary and secondary. And then when we started talking about mask, you talked about secondary, but you dropped down to 10 years old. Help me make some distinctions. Is elementary grades K through six? Is it grades K through eight? Where do we go with that? Yeah. Next yeah, Mr. Alexander, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate your, uh, yeah, some of this we're also, you know, I, although we're uh, the experts, as Mr. Castile said, we're, you know, you guys don't know um, what we're, how expert we are. I think we weren't that specific. I think in different locations across the state, fifth and sixth graders might be cohorted in the same campus and in other places they might not be. Um, I think I, I might might want Hannah to answer that, but we just came up with an age at which it might not be unreasonable to ask the kids to keep those masks on as they transit to and fro. Uh, we thought it was probably not worth the bang for the buck to try and do that in younger kids with the what we know about knowledge of asymptomatic kids that age uh, in the United States. So we didn't get that specific just because we thought the composition of the schools might be slightly different in different parishes across the state. And also, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer uh, on that. There's, there's not one. Also, if someone told me, hey, we can't get the desks to be exactly six feet apart, this is what we can do. My answer is you do what you can. I think the effort that you undertake to physically distance and try and promote hand hygiene is the biggest thing you can do with the knowledge that we're working with kids ages five to 18. And, you know, there, there's gotta be a little bit of give and take. Yes, sir, and I appreciate that, I really do. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, there, there's a lot left here in terms of executing, uh, in terms of interpreting some of the, uh, uh, margin that's allowed in some of this. So maximum extent possible is interpreted in one group by in one way and another by another. So if I told you that our, our desk would be three feet apart, uh, would another district say, well, we can get almost three, but we can get 30 inches apart. And so I, I, I don't know where there, there, we really do need some guidelines to where we're saying, okay, that's really you're compromising public health here, and that's dangerous. Versus, we believe we're, you're within the uh, the language of our intent here of maximum extent possible. And I go back to the mask. In Ascension, we have K through five schools, so our fifth graders might be walking around with masks, wondering why aren't kindergarten through fourth graders doing the same thing? Yeah. So we need to balance some of that, and parents would be likely having some of those similar questions. And all I could do is say, well, that's because Dr. Finger and Dr. Welch said 10 year olds. Well, I think actually with that knowledge, I think that's great feedback to get for this committee. And we might be able to take that back and see what we can do to adjust the language of the recommendations to make sure that it makes sense. Because I agree with you uh, conceptually that that would make more sense to have your, that school that's K through five unmasked. But I think you're right. The devil in the details is definitely there. And you could go down a rabbit hole with each of these across the entire state. 
um, which is why we tried to come up with something that allowed for some local interpretation. I would defer to you, Mr. Alexander, for that example and say, yeah, that makes complete sense for the example that you just gave me to not require it for a single cohort of kids within a larger school. Um, I don't think it provides a lot of bang for the buck for you, quite honestly. Um, and I don't think you're compromising any degree of contagiousness or public health by making that recommendation. And look, I, I don't want to drive us down any rabbit holes here. So I don't know. I'm, I'm about to have to like weigh in on this as like a vote, so to speak, as part of this group. And so there are, the devil is in the details in terms of my representing superintendents, so to speak, in this task force here that we're do, using. And so where there may be some big level comfort levels that are, um, you know, you have it as a big picture. I'm comfortable with a lot of this. Okay. But details here, like on the next page with transportation, Hanna. Um, what, when we're, we're using very specific language there, 25, 50, and 75%. So when I order a bus I, when, from Bluebird or whoever it may be from, I'm ordering a 71, 72 passenger bus. But that 7172 passenger bus is the capacity for that bus. In your vision, I feel like, based on what the conversations we've had, that we're envisioning two people per seat. But at a primary level, that capacity is three people per seat. So that's a very different interpretation of those percentages. Because when we did the guidance for transporting children to summer at 25%, that was almost like a single individual on every other seat, which if you think that, you know, two seats hold four people, then if you put one person on every other seat, you're at 25% capacity. But if you consider three people per seat, that'd be six per two seats. That's a whole different number. So we just gotta be sure that we're interpreting all of this from exactly the same perspective when we're writing these Again, you said it best, sir, the devil is in the details. Yeah, I think would it help you if, you know, these questions come up um, to have someone like you um, at the local level consult with the regional health official to sort of get the absolute answer? Because again, these aren't things that, these are th th things that are based on our most current understanding and knowledge of the disease, which is why we left a little bit of latitude in them for um, the folks making these recommendations, imp implementing these on the local level like you are with your team to be able to do and do what makes sense. Um, would, would, that be, would that be helpful to you if you could consult with your local health officials to help uh, define some of these? Um, I think, you know, just to chime in, David, from my own perspective, I think we're trying to find and just to characterize where we are in terms of the development of these guidelines. On the one hand, we have superintendents and other leaders saying, I need a definite prescribed recommendation. On the other, we're hearing, I need and want flexibility because that specific recommendation may not work in the literally hundreds of permutations of schools in our state. And so, I mean, I'm just describing the tension that we have and where we're trying to land, which is reasonable guidelines for maintaining public health and safety with provisions like maximum extent possible. So that if you're saying, well, I'd like to deviate, you know, is the distance of four feet acceptable? Three, two, one. It's going to depend on a multitude of factors, at which point you're best to consult, I think, a, a, a health official on that particular consideration. But if you're seeing particular areas that you think need, and I'm trying to just get us to a place where we can um, have concrete changes to make to this document if you think that they are needed. Um, if you see areas where you think a truly different recommendation is needed or specific language is needed, I think that would really help us in terms of moving these documents along. That, you know, we added this maximum extent possible language to create that flexibility, but I'm, I'm having a hard time in other places seeing where we could 
create some baseline expectation that's clear enough to act upon, but also create some flexibility. So I think that's a, um, I apologize, long-winded way of saying if you have particular recommendations about what we could change here, I think we'd be very open to them, understanding that uh, in reality, you're probably going to need consultation with someone local in order to, um, you know, implement very specific measures. Just another point um, concretely on the elementary versus secondary here. I think, David, the point here is more so around if you have children that are really too young to for mask compliance or to reasonably maintain physical distance from one another, static groupings is indicated. If you have children who are old enough to generally get on board with mask compliance and who can keep phys some physical distance between one another, you can change the group's composition. If you think it would be beneficial to change then the labels of elementary and secondary, which we thought were sort of you know, simple and relatable, we're happy to do that. But that's the that those are the criteria on which those two different decisions um, rest, more or less. Yeah, Hannah, I, I, I agree that it's, you know, what's difficult as we really get to a point to where we're getting the right guidance from Louisiana Office of Public Health. And again, we all have the same goal. Uh, I heard Dr. Finger and Dr. Welch both say that we really want to get our children back in school. And we yeah. um, honestly, if I look at phase one and phase two, uh, that's not realistic that we can uh, likely get all of our children back in school on those two phases just because, you know, they just there's there's some very specific things where you're talking about groups of 10 and groups of 25 that's not executable. But in, in phase three, it is when you start moving up to groups of 50. And there are some, they're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of questions to, to work through. And so what I don't wanna give is the perception that we believe that we can execute these guidelines as written today because we don't even understand some of the details in these guidelines to make that decision. Uh, and then, you know, we've, we've got, I do need to know what is, I don't know, is two feet the, the minimum is, so it would be helpful there to the maximum extent possible, never to, um, you know, uh, never to get any closer in a setting, a classroom environment of 30 inches or four feet or 48 or whatever it is that you have to put there. So, um, yeah, I, I get what you're trying to accomplish and I really appreciate it because we really do all need some unique things. Uh, uh, I'm envisioning try, trying to get 2,300 kids on campus at a school, at, at a high school, uh, not crowding the doors and yet taking temperatures as they come in and some of those kind of things because i want we all want to every superintendent out in louisiana wants to execute the health guidance that's being provided by dr welsh about thanks david um dr welsh would you offer any revision to the six feet or is that or any further for, for that matter any further context about why we use six feet as the starting point Hannah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, just it, it's really simple. It's the way the disease is spread. The, the disease is spread by water droplets, and those water droplets tend to fall when someone coughs or sneezes or speaks loudly within a six-foot radius. And so if you are within that six-foot radius and someone is ill, you may, you're at a much higher risk of getting, uh, uh, you know, being exposed to the disease than if you are outside that six-foot different distance. And again, um, I, I empathize with all of you. The, in, the intent of transportation and schooling is oftentimes to get as many children in a small space as possible to more efficiently educate and transport them. I, I completely 100% understand that. But there are going to be places within this guidance where that, where that goal of, of efficient and, and close proximity transportation or education uh, uh, directly contradicts what we know about this particular disease. And uh, again, with the six foot distance, Hannah, what it is, is, is it's much easier if you are sitting near someone within six foot of you, um, due to the activities that we do, cough, sneeze, talk, uh, to acquire the disease, than if you are outside six foot di distance. Thank you, that's very helpful context, I appreciate it. Uh, other questions from the group about um, the, uh, proposed guidelines or the guidance. 
Hannah, uh, Patrick, uh, St. Landry, uh, a, a statement and a question. I, I guess um, um, if prior to March 13th, um, I, I had some conversations with my health official and she simply just said, it gave me some minimum guidance. And then she said, you can exceed those things. So I think something may help us a little bit if, they, if we had some, some minimums and knowing that we have the ability to exceed, to meet or exceed that, uh, may help uh, David and I out a little bit and any other superintendent. Uh, my question is that when we're looking at uh, the static groups in particular, whether it's elementary or secondary, uh, we have a number of students that participate in other uh, extracurricular activities, um, uh, such as football and the like. Um, how could that affect uh, and, and also riding the bus. They won't be in static groups on the bus or on the on a football field or, or a volleyball court. How could that possibly affect other students or children uh, that would, would be in those static groups? And I'll give you one last example before you, prior to this call, before you answer, um, I was on a different uh, call and the uh, individual said that his son, which plays uh, summer baseball, wasn't positive. He came out positive when tested. And so if that happens with any of our kids, although we're in static groups, because he's, he's doing other things outside of those groups, he could potentially infect other kids in those static groups. So it'd be kind of, so what, I guess, what is your recommendation, Dr. Finger or, or whomever to kind of help facilitate that? Yeah. So, yeah, Hana, do you want me to take that one? Yes, that would be great, Dr. Walsh. Thank you. Yeah, so, so there are going to, and again, these are just general guidance. As Dr. Finger has mentioned, you know, the static grouping and the whole intent of static grouping is just to minimize the number of children that, that other people come into contact with, with each day. But, you know, these children are going to ride the bus. They're going to go home. They're going to interact with their families um, and, and possibly other people. And again, what, you, what the intent should be is, is to try and minimize the amount of contact between, uh, between students. Now, just remember that also in parallel with everything you all are doing in trying to keep children safe, either using the static grouping or the six foot distance, the physical distancing, the environmental cleaning, the recommendations that children um, who are ill stay home. Remember that there's also going to be that similar process for these outside groups. For example, the volleyball coach and the volleyball team will be practicing social distancing, cleaning of the equipment, um, making sure that they exercise outside as much as possible. And then finally, if, if, a, if a person does come up positive, remember that there is going to be a process, again, that you all are not responsible for, but identifying that child and then really finding out who they might have exposed. And I think the biggest misconception about contact tracing is that, that anyone in the room or anyone you know, within a 100-foot perimeter will be contacted. That's absolutely not the case. We really truly have found that you have to be within a six foot distance for more than 10, about 10 or 15 minutes of someone with a case who's actually spreading the disease to be at risk to get it. So um, there will be a process, for example, the, the example you gave of the baseball team, if the child does come up positive, there will be a process through the public health office to find out exactly where that child was and what they did and then assess the people who may have come into contact with them. Not everyone who just passed by or rode the bus or, um, or, or was in a specific classroom with this child, in fact, will need to be quarantined. It will just be a subset of those people. Most likely, it's oftentimes just their family, believe it or not. Um, but, but there will be other people who may be recommended. So just remember, there's these other processes going on through athletics, through extracurricular activities where they're following rules as well the bus guidance and the, and the static grouping guidance. And again, all of it is trying to minimize uh, contact between children. But again, people are gonna you know, slowly 50% relive their lives. So there is going to be some crossover and we understand that. And that's perfectly, we understand that that's going to happen. Hi, now this is Patrick Dobo and I have a question. Um, so it's either, I guess for Dr. Finger, Dr. Welch, or, or maybe you, Hana, where will there ever be a point in the not too distant future, hopefully like soon, that the state, whether it's through the Department of Health or even the Department of Education, move to where something isn't just guidance or will at some point 
everything would just have to be on the local school districts and our, the, the local charter boards to make their own final calls on how they're gonna go forward. So I can share and if I'm, I don't know if Dr. Reed is on this call or not, um, but the way that the Resilient Louisiana Commission is working is that for any sector of the economy, whether it's casinos or hair salons, as I said earlier, two extreme examples, or institutions of higher education, the leadership of that commission has asked all of these different subgroups to more or less develop guidelines for operations. And so that is our charge. That's, that's the charge that we are fulfill, fulfilling, is to develop guidance that is informed by, and really more or less directed by public health to govern the unique circumstances of opening to the public in light of this pandemic in these different phases of reopening. So that is to say, I don't know, but at this time we have been asked by the governor and the Resilient Louisiana Commission leadership to develop guidelines for operating schools safely. Some of these guidelines are required and as you can see in New Orleans and in other parts of the state, similarly, there are requirements for businesses that are opening. I went into a business the other day and I wasn't allowed in until they took my temperature and it was too high at first because I was in a hot car um, and they made me wait until my temperature got down to normal and I was let in. Now it may be, and they're complying with a set of rules, I imagine. It may be that at a later time, we have a better handle on this virus or it's less of a public health threat and uh, there are fewer restrictions. But I guess my point is that we have been, we, we meaning the leaders of this K-12 subgroup have been charged by the Resilient Louisiana Commission to develop guidance for schools to use, which is our, our charge and purpose. Now, Dr. Welch and Dr. Finger, you may have a different sort of medical perspective on whether or not there may be a time when we can simply say, hey, look, try to keep groups small, get people to wash hands, clean your surfaces, and that more or less should take care of it. I don't, I don't know. I think it would be a question more so for you all about the, the sort of you know, public health perspective a few months out from now, which I know you don't have crystal balls, but you may have a sense. So, so why don't I go first and I'll see if uh, Dr. Finger has anything to add. So uh, uh, yes, there, there will come a time. And again, uh, as Dr. Finger has mentioned several times, this disease has only been around for three months and it's just amazing the number of people who have gotten it. And of course, the number of people who, who have died as well. So I, I think it is important to remember just how new this is, but also that we will get to a point as we learn more and understand more how it impacts certain people, who it does and does not affect more seriously, and, and how it's spread and whether children are, are a mechanism of spread or not. The more we learn and the more time, even just two weeks, three months, something like that. And then remember, this isn't gonna be forever. This is a very temporary situation where it is my hope that, that you know, there's over 80 uh, medicines under investigational um, you know, research right now to see if they will be effective in preventing the disease. We know of more than 55 companies that are, that are hopefully producing a vaccine for this as well. And as soon as uh, uh, we get an effective treatment and or as soon as enough people have had it or we get a vaccine, that is gonna change the entire landscape. And, and there will be a time when we uh, theoretically get back to normal or near normal, um, I think it's going to be a while for all of us uh, uh, to where, um, you know, we're going to go back to completely normal. But, you know, again, I'd like to remind people that this is just temporary, that we do hope that this, this is, you know, maybe a six month, nine month, one year endeavor. And then as we get effective treatments, possibly a vaccine and understand more about the disease, we can change the guidance and, and make it um, more specific and yet, uh, you know, give more local autonomy to how you enact it. And I don't know if Dr. Finger had anything to add to that. No, I think you pretty much covered it all, Dr. Welsh. Thank you. 
Hannah, this is Caroline. Uh, for those that don't know me, Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools. Going back on some of the things said as early on as uh, uh, Mr. Falk and then some of the superintendents, I think for charter schools, there's 150 charter schools throughout the state. And when we talk about this and think about it, we believe that there really does need to be some conformity and like what I'll call the non-negotiables that any school in the state would be following related to these guidelines. And maybe just using the word guidelines is causing some, some trouble. Like I refer to it as these are the non-negotiables if you are opening a school to children and teachers. And those non-negotiables are the distancing for this age, the the mask for this age, whatever that might look like. But I think our greatest concern taking a place like New Orleans where all of those schools are their own LEAs, meaning they act like their own district. We worry about one school following certain guidelines and then another school doing something totally different. And that goes for type twos across the state. So you have parents saying like, oh, well, my kid over in this school has their temperature taken and the mask is on and whatever the case may be. But over here, it's like, you know, free for all. So again, I think my comments are and my push to us as a subgroup is whatever gets out there, ultimately, I do think there needs to be some very, again, specific non-negotiables that may change, sounds like over time. But I think that people are looking for some real push and again, to me, it comes from when parents start asking schools what's going on, these things seem a little softer than I think they should be. Blurry, I don't know what word I want to use there, Hannah. Hopefully I'm making my point. Yes, thank you, um, Caroline, that's very clear. And again, I think this just goes back to the earlier conversation about trying to find that sweet spot of uh, having some uniform really non-negotiable recommendations that are truly essential for maintaining the public's health based on what we know at this point in time about this virus, while also providing some level of flexibility to reflect the and, and really address the hundreds of permutations of school facilities, school schedules, um, geography, transportation needs, and so on. So I agree with you the memo is meant to form the basis for really truly what is non-negotiable and we can think about and i would take recommendations on a different term for that document but it's just sort of finding that balance um and and i don't know if um dr welch or dr finger if there's anything else you would want to contribute on this point but it's um it's well taken by me at least caroline thank you Nothing for me, Hannah. No. I agree. Yeah, nothing specific. Thank you, Caroline, for raising that. And uh, um, Patrick Jenkins, again, from uh, St. Landry. Uh, just a question. I, I think that was a good segue uh, by Ms. Romer uh, regarding the specifics. So mask can be a very controversial. People are very, <laughs> very oh. passionate uh, for or against wearing masks. And so uh, as a superintendent, uh, that may may be a question that comes from the community. So I guess my question would be uh, regarding mask would simply be, uh, I think currently in the guidance, it says should wear a mask. Um, should we, uh, should it be must or even require to wear a mask uh, in, in the schools? Because if we leave it as should, then that leaves a little bit of amb ambiguity there. And so that gets, as Ms. Romer said, parents have to be able to decide well, I will, I won't. And I'm not talking about the age. Uh, we can go with 10 forward, uh, but I, should it be uh, must or even require? Um, and and yeah. again, is it because of the think, more, Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead, Superintendent. No, no, I, I just, and, and maybe you wrote it that way so it gives us more authority to make bit, that decision. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, um, again, if I don't, if I don't tell my, my staff to wear a mask, they won't wear a mask. So, yeah. so. so here I'll say just sort of to play out this particular instance of finding that balance point, 
And then I'd like to hear just globally from Dr. Finger and Dr. Welch on why masks matter. I think we don't want, for example, a child to be sent home because they don't have a mask or uh, they become so uncomfortable that they take their mask off at some point during the day. The same thing, I think, for a teacher. So we don't want to err so far on the side of requirements that it really impedes kids being able to attend school and creates, uh, you know, over, uh, enforcement that is detrimental to a child's learning or their social and emotional growth. On the other hand, we know from the public health experts on this call that wearing masks cuts down on transmission of the virus, so it's a good protective measure. So here we're trying to find that balance of, okay, it's more reasonable that older children will wear, will be able to tolerate mask usage. Also, older children are more likely to be mixing groups. Let's say fifth grade, 10 years old. This is Virginia's recommendation um, for context. Um, but say to the maximum extent possible, understanding that it was very difficult for anyone to have a mask on at all times during an eight hour school day. And the most important places to do that are in these, are in these areas. We, don't, we hope that we don't see no one wearing a mask at any point in time. We also hope that we don't see students or teachers being penalized for taking their masks off to become more comfortable at different points during the day. So that's sort of how we arrived here. And you know, if, you, if there, I would take a suggestion from this group about whether or not we need to move it up or down that continuum of prescriptiveness, that's how we ended up here. I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit from Dr. Finger and Dr. Welch on why masks matter also, just so that this group has an understanding of that, that piece. Sure. Uh, uh, Frank, you want to take that one first? Sure. Why, why don't I take that one first? Um, people, and I think part of the confusion comes from the fact that uh, uh, early on in the pandemic, we weren't recommending masks because we didn't really understand a whole lot uh, about the disease itself. And I think most people think about wearing a mask and does it protect me or not protect me? Um, and, and in a lot of diseases, wearing a mask doesn't necessarily protect you very well from getting a disease. But what we have learned and what we've known for quite some time, and that's why your surgeon wears a mask when he's operating on you, is wearing a mask does help prevent a person with the disease from spreading it to other people and we really are finding with, with COVID-19 that it significantly cuts down on the spread of COVID-19. So again, as a public health recommendation, wearing a mask overall cuts down on transmission of the disease. Dr. Finger? Yeah, I share that and I'd like to amplify it by comma, especially when you're actively sick. I think that's the biggest thing. And to answer Ms. Romer's question about what's non-negotiable here, I think staying home when you're sick is a non-negotiable. And I think that's gonna be a big thing. It's certainly changed how the healthcare workforce has uh, adopted to the new reality over the last three months, that a low grade fever that they might've pushed through previously and come to work has become a stay home, make sure you're, uh, you, know, you, you don't have COVID-19 sort of thing. And I think that same sort of, attention should apply to um, our students and our and our uh, teachers. Um, I think we did craft this sort of trying to allow with some degree of local autonomy with the knowledge that our um, shared learning about this disease would probably be expanded greatly by late August and September with the event. So we wanted to be able to be nimble and get uh, your teams that new information. So, you know, I think there, there might not be one answer that uh, everyone on the call or in the state is happy with, but again, it's a fine balance with trying to get it right and match what we've seen locally. I will tell you, we don't have enough information in the United States yet for what this might look like and will there be school spread but it doesn't appear to be that there's a lot of um, student to student transmission in those countries that have reopened up yet. What they have found is that kids can get it when they're in a sort of shared experience out of school or in a sort of group environment where there's a lot of close contact. We just don't have enough of that information as of this date and time. Thank you. Other questions from the group?
So Hannah, is the um, uh, is it a requirement or a mandate that uh, temperature checks are done initially at the beginning of the school day? That is, and uh, that is included in the guidelines at this time, uh, David. That students are assessed on arrival and throughout the day, including an initial temperature check. So that's not a guideline; that's a mandate. That is included in the. Department of Health's memorandum to school systems. Yes. And again, just a simple thing, Hannah, I, I, maybe I'm a broken record, but like guidelines and guidance, like I just feel like you need to be much more specific, like these at this moment are things you must do. Look, none of, yeah, I understand. None of these things are going to carry the force of law or policy. We're not writing, we're not legislators, or at least I'm certainly not, nor am I proposing these policies to the Bessie board. What we're trying to communicate are the baseline expectations that should be implemented across the board. I mean, I'm, if, if people have a suggestion for what we should call them beyond guidelines, I'm more than willing to take that suggestion. But they're not, at the end of the day, they're not laws. They're not policies. It's non-regulatory guidance that is coming from the Department of Health and then supplemental guidance that is coming from our agency. That is the form that every piece of guidance coming from the coming through the Resilient Louisiana Commission is taking. So Hannah, so this is this is Patrick Dobart again. There may be, I don't know if like this this deck that you all have, like what could be helpful is if maybe we just see as a, a subgroup, and I mean, others would obviously have to agree to it, but still like on mask, like I'm more than convinced that that is a best practice that should be followed um, widely. And so if there's like caveats, so like while this is guidance, for example, you know, but we say DHH and others have said that a best practice, if you want to lessen the likelihood of spreading than wearing masks, like prioritizing certain things in this. Because what I'm concerned about is no one's going to like take stances and everybody's going to like point fingers to somebody else saying, well, they told me to do this or they didn't tell me to do that. When at the end of the day, we're just trying to keep everyone mm -hmm. safe and trying to keep this thing from spreading. And so maybe re, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's like a way to reword or to like just continuously share, like if you want to lessen the, the chance to spread. Um, you know, I keep hearing Dr. Finger and, and others share that like, right, this is still in early stages and we're learning a lot. But as we're learning, we could be risking and are risking the lives of individuals. And so for me, it's, you know, I would be remiss if I just didn't share publicly that, feel strongly that we should be caveating as much as possible, like, the end game and what we're trying to do, keep kids safe. So while if it's K-5 or K-8, whatever it is, we want to keep kids and families safe and to ensure that one way to absolutely ensure that we're less likely to spread is to wear masks. And then in my mind, you know, if educators, anyone is questioning why they have to wear a mask, it's like, here's why. You know, I think to me, that almost lessens the argument because then if someone is going to be cavalier enough to say, well, I don't want to wear it because it's not in the guidance, they're being cavalier with someone's life. And I don't think that's right. And so for me, I would love to just have a stress. Like when we say best practices, not loosely, but very strongly, these are the best practices. And in any way possible, districts and charters and schools should consider whatever they are. And I, I feel like washing hands is obvious that and wearing masks as much as possible, if not like all the time, regardless of like space, because this disease doesn't know if it's six feet, eight feet, somebody sneezes, yells, or what have you. If the droplets make a certain trek, someone will get it. And so maybe that's a better way to ground this, to ensure that people understand the severity of it and why we need to have guidelines and guidance, and then they, they can make decisions as to what best fits them. Yeah. And that's a really good point, Patrick. I do think that there's more that we can do in the opening of both of these tools to bring that point home. I mean, we all, I mean, maybe this is just in New Orleans, but I know personally people who have been very sick, 
some of whom sadly have passed away. It's not, it's this, um, as much as we get into the details of this sort of the compliance aspects of these guidelines, I mean, it's really ultimately about keeping folks' health, safe, safe, safety and livelihoods really in, in our hearts and in what we do. So it's a good point. And I think we can certainly update the introductory language. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Welch, I'm curious to know if you have any thought on or actually any perspective on whether or not the, um, the uh, sort of extent to which these, the guidelines for different economic sectors are termed differently um, that might help us find something more descriptive or more accurate than guideline. And also, if you could share anything about the level of prescription in other sectors, uh, guidelines or guidance, I think that would be interesting for this, or I'd be curious to hear about that. And it might be helpful for this group as well. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think that in other, I'm gonna take the second question first, Hannah, and, and that is how prescriptive have we been with, with other organizations? say, uh, restaurants or hair salons or tattoo parlors or um, uh, uh, places like that. And it has been extremely prescriptive. It has, it has told them exactly, specifically, what they can and cannot do. Um, much like this group, though, there were, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a big state. And when you say a restaurant is a restaurant, that is simply not true. There are, there are you know, hundreds of different types and forms and and ways that you could do things and seating capacity and um, rules for uh, employees and uh, takeout or how you handle transactions. I mean, it just was endless. And so much like is going on with this group, there is a lot of back and forth between people who both want things very, very prescriptive and very, very direct. And then on the other end, want some flexibility while they feel they're doing the best they can. And so with, with each and every group that I've said in on these, these conversations are not unusual. I do think though that, that it's important as several people have mentioned that, that we fall back on what we're actually trying to do. We are physically trying to keep people away from each other. And, and that's just as simple as it can be. Um, if, if we all could take a two week break and just stay by ourselves for two weeks, this disease would be gone. It actually would, and and we wouldn't have it anymore. But but that's simply not possible. So um, just know that that everyone else is is having these types of challenges. But but just recognize that for every person who wants things more prescriptive and to have a rule written down, um, we're going to have someone who doesn't want that. And and so to try and at least try and interpret the the guidance and guidelines and what we're trying to do in a way that, that says, you know, I'm doing my best to keep kids, to, to keep people away from each other and, and to slow the spread of the disease. I think that's more the goal. Um, and, and I know it's hard in this environment as well. Sometimes it's easier with a rule that says you do this, you don't do this. Um, and then we have a thousand different questions about how you can, how you can bend that rule or adjust it one way or another. So, just, just know with whatever you, you call it and however you implement or, or try and do it, what you're trying to do is slow the spread of disease. And what we're asking you to do is, is try your best. Um, it, it's those situations that, that people have just said, oh, forget it, and put 500 people in a small room and closed the doors and, and turned off the air conditioning. That's where we have a real problem. It's not where people have tried their best. Hannah. Thanks, that was very helpful. Um, other questions for um, the group on guidelines or guidance, and then I'd like to talk about um, what's, what's next. <clears throat> Hannah, this is Ashley. Yes. Ashley Lois. Hey, I was thinking, and we, you know, regionally, we may need to have these conversations within school districts, within regions, so that we're all at least regionally making consistent decisions. I think that's what many of us are concerned about is making a decision that's different from your neighboring school 
or your neighboring school district that puts you, you know, those superintendents um, and teachers and school administrators in a position to defend something that's different than others. And so, you know, regionally having some sit down conversations about, you know, in Northeast Louisiana, in my region, here's what, you know, the five surrounding uh, districts may want to talk about just so that we're all on the same page. We may not always agree, but we may at least be in the same neighborhood of what we're doing. So there's not these really just very different um, versions of how to do the best we can. In the end, we all know the goal is to get kids back to school and, and for learning to occur. And I think that we have to be thoughtful and we're trying to do our best, but we're also doing the hard work of bringing kids back, which is why this isn't easy. We could easily say, stay home, or we could easily say, you know, it's easier to just not bring kids back, but we know that's not what's best. And so we're in that middle ground. And I think those regional conversations may be helpful just because, you know, it gives us some context and it gives us a buffer when we're talking to a neighboring school district and those families to talk to each other. We want to all be doing the best we can. That's really helpful, Ashley. Thank you. And I know that um, over the coming weeks, our team will hold webinars um, for school systems and provide direct access to medical professionals as we're doing today, but also um, through our uh, field support teams, um, hope to um, create opportunities um, on a regional basis for systems to coordinate with one another on um, what implementation might look like um, and where regions may choose to deviate some from these, um, from these guidelines and so forth. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're set to end at two o'clock. Uh, and I am, I am thinking about um, the path forward here. I think that there are probably uh, a couple of different options for us. One would be to, uh, and I'm open to hearing other options from the subgroup members as well, and particularly Ken, if you, um, as my co-chair, if you would like to chime in here, please do. I think we could um, vote to receive and refer the, uh, the guidance as it's written for inclusion in the uh, task forces recommendations, which will go to Resilient Louisiana Commission. We could vote to change, to um, receive and refer contingent on certain changes, which might include the titling of the guidelines or guidance and the content of the introductory um, language, particularly around um, David, to your point earlier, what is really a baseline condition that should be met versus what is implementation guidance or supports. And also, Patrick um, Dobar, to your point earlier around the intent of these guidelines and guidance. So you could, we could take a vote on receive and refer contingent on these recommendations. Or if it's the wish of the, of the subgroup, we could certainly create more time for deliberation with public health experts and others. I'm, um, I have no preference which direction we, in which we choose to go. I would only point out that if we choose to continue deliberating, then it gives us more time for deliberation, but it um, holds us back or holds school systems back, I think, from really getting into the details of planning and implementation. Um, but it is, it is this group's decision which direction in which to proceed. If there's another motion that someone would offer um, in place of any three of those or in addition to any three of those, we could certainly entertain um, a different motion as well. But um, those I see are probably the three different paths forward. Approve as is, approve contingent on certain changes, uh, or not approve is actually receive and refer on certain changes or um, not vote at all today and instead uh, extend deliberation uh, with public health and with others. So. Quick question, Hannah. Yes, sir. On, on, um, when I look through this and, you know, there's, uh, like I said before, there's some points of clarity here when he's talking about a bus 
with percentages, what, what capacity are we referring to? Would it be the standard industry capacity that, that was recommended by the bus itself or some other perception that we were talking about two people per seat? When I think about what your third option was there, um, there are some things that I think I've learned today that are just gonna be non-negotiables. You're gonna have to check the temperature of every child that comes in the building every day. And you're gonna have to do, I mean, there's a handful of things that we know that for schools to be able to execute starting school next year, these are the three or four things that you're going to have to think about how to execute. And then where, I don't know where the margin is in any of this, like, you know, in phase three with groups of 50, could that be 60, could that be 70? Or do we need to start telling marching bands that you're going to have to reduce to 50? I mean, that's, that's all you can do. And so there are some things that we could uh, consider with more deliberation, while at the same time, maybe putting out, there's some hard and fast lines with some of this that, you know, that you need to start planning toward if you're going to open school, uh, whether it's, you know, taking temperature or you're going to have to plan for two trips on a bus because that's, and I, I, I'm not going to go much longer, but it's 75%, really, whether it's 80% or 90%, anything above 50, anything less so, than yeah. So David, just, just, just to put a fine point on this so that we can kind of get the group moving in a direction. And I have a question for Dr. Welch as well. Would it, so if we don't put 50, what would we put? Like, I just don't, I like, I don't, um, I don't understand. I, don't understand what we would put if it were not a number. And I guess what we don't understand is why 75% worse than or, or better than 80%. Uh, so those percentages, I get it. I mean, you have to put a number, but what, what are, what, where do those numbers come from? And if we better sure. understand. Yes. I, Dr. Welch, could you more, could you explain this group size recommendations and also the capacity recommendations and also how they re might relate to other uh, guidance that the state is issuing across different groups? Right. So uh, uh, again, I, I understand and respect the challenge, but uh, from a public health and disease transmission perspective, you want to keep people away from each other. And if you have 100% of people in a room, having 25% is a lot better in terms of tra disease transmission and having 50% is, is, you know, not as good as 25%, but it's uh, uh, much better than 100%. And the closer people are together, the more likely it is for this disease to spread. And, um, uh, uh, you know, certainly the fire marshal came up with the 25, 50, 75% guidance, and that's the same guidance that it is for restaurants. We have that for um, hair salons. We have that for businesses. We have that for... Um, and, and it follows, you know, virtually every aspect of resilient Louisiana is operating on 25, 50, 75 percent in phase one, two and three. And I, I don't know, again, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I would ask that that the intent and, and the spirit of what they're trying to do be followed more than an exact percentage. And it's where. Uh, you know, well, a hundred percent is not fifty percent, but fifty-two percent could be the best. You know, you could do depending on seating capacity of the bus, and that would be totally acceptable. But it, understand what we're trying to do here, and and then interpret the guidance. Thank you. That's helpful. Um. Thoughts from the group on how you'd like to proceed in terms of um, emotion, or is there a different motion that you would recommend here? If not, my instinct would be to propose uh, receive and refer with uh, contingencies and um, that our team would recirculate these documents updated with the contingencies um, before including them in the task forces report. That would be my re recommendation, but um, on how to, how to vote on this matter. But if 
someone else in the group would like to offer a different motion, we can certainly entertain that. I would make a motion, Hannah, that we deliberate more with some guidance from those that can execute the plans. Uh, we understand what we're up against in school systems. I don't, I agree with you. We, we do have a sense of urgency, but I don't know if that urgency has to be today. So uh, if we could have some more deliberation around all of this, that would be a motion I would like to make. I don't know if you're going to second or not. I second that, Mrs. Patrick, no vote. I second that, Dave. And the additional deliberation, just to be, just to clarify before we ask the whole vote, we would be reconvening the public health response group to review all of these guidelines again. Is that accurate? I would like to suggest that maybe we bring some school system <laughs> folks to the table that, that are actually having to operate and, and help the healthcare professionals understand some of the challenges that we we experience with some of the the, the healthcare guidance. We don't want to compromise that safety. Uh, Mr. Dobar got, uh, said it best. I mean, we we want to do what's safe, but where we don't know how to do is we don't know how to wiggle through the margin there. And so, having conversations with healthcare professionals to say. For us to check in 2,300 students before they come into the building would take X amount of time. And then healthcare professionals tell us, well, maybe you could get them to classrooms first and do it. So some of the things where we're trying to execute uh, some of the guidelines, as we call them guidelines, and we understand how to execute them better would, would, would be helpful, I think, if you put some superintendents on that discussion. Okay. Uh i think i missed something here because i thought you had met with superintendents had a group and some of this came out of meetings already am i in incorrect didn't you say that earlier uh, that yes, one of your slides yes ma'am so we've held work um informal work groups with um a group of around 15 superintendents we've met probably over the course of the last month for i'd say roughly four to five hours We've included the reason, the reason why I'm asking this is because I guess because I am associated with schools and I know we are waiting to get some guidance that we can use. Yes, ma'am. And so we might be in a, in a whole different ball game from some other people. But if we're going to take more time to del deliberate, uh, the way that I look at this is that our schools may put some students on the bus to meet the guidelines and come back and ask for can we use a little bit more flexibility here? I just we got to get started on this, and and I, so I'm not I'm, I'm I want to refer this some kind of way so it gets it, it moves. I don't I don't really think we ought to come back. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm holding this motion to defer. By the way, I'm, I've not lost it. I'm holding it, but um, I do want to hear some. There, I know there are some other comments, please. Uh, I'd, like to hear, I'd also like to hear from public health because just I know there's been significant hours uh, that that public health officials have spent reviewing this. It's gone all the way up to Dr. Bu for his his recommendation and sign off of, of where we're at. And does does deferring and waiting and coming back and and providing more information to the public health officials. Is, is that going to, to, to change some things like right now, like thermometer checking, like uh, the static group size of 50, like, like wearing a mask, like, though, like a bus capacity of 75% instead of being full? I, I, like, are those things even negotiable at this point or, or, or not? I, I think that would help me. And then I would just also say that as part of the SREB, reopening task force group that I've been part of every Thursday for the past uh, little six, six or seven weeks where we get an update from SREB and it's all state representatives are there is that we're on par with other states right now. Like this is, this is, this is, this is very similar to the guidance that has been adopted by Virginia, the guidance that has been approved so that Arkansas can move forward, the guidance that has been approved so that Mississippi can move forward, the guidance that is forthcoming next week from South Carolina that is moving forward. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's actually more flexible than, than, than some of that guidance. But 
you know, I, I do, I am concerned because we, we do hear often about how we need to get the guidance out there so school systems can start planning. And I guess what I just don't know, and perhaps Dr. Welch, I'd like to hear from you is, does, does waiting and continuing to deliberate is, do you think that's going to change some of the current recommendations or, or is it something that the recommendations would be made today based on today's current knowledge of COVID and then as things change, then, you know, things will have to become more specific or more relaxed based on where we are. So Dr. Welch, what? You may be on mute, Dr. Welch. There we go, Hannah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so uh, just to answer the simple question, I, I do not think Dr. Bilyeu and Dr. Guidry are going to take, you know, if we have a series of other meetings and say they didn't like 50%, they'd prefer 60%. Um, and then I know you all know this, you all work for school kids. 60%, um, well, can I do 65? Well, can we do 70? And well, can we just do things normally? And, uh, you know, there has to be some line that is drawn where, where people try and their best to follow the guidance, knowing what we're trying to do. So um, if, if the expectation of this group is you're going to convene a series of public health experts and we're just going to eliminate the guidance and say everything can go, go back to normal in phase two, it, it's just not going to happen. And if your difficulty is with 50% and 75% and want 52% and 73% or something, I think those things can be worked out through our regional medical directors on an individual basis. But as for the general guidance for cleaning, for mask wearing, for taking a temperature, for transportation, and for physical distancing, these are the things that we know prevent COVID now. So those things are, are not going to change in terms of public health recommendations. Um, I, I know that specific instances and every occurrence of everything that's going to happen may require some tweaking one direction or other, uh, you know, depending on the physical size of a bus or a classroom. But I do not believe, you know, I'm 100% positive that by taking this group and, and again, we've heard quite a bit of feedback from quite a few superintendents and teachers and understand and respect the difficulty given that the, the, the intent of education is to put lots of students in a small space, on a bus, getting to school as efficiently as possible, and that is a contraindication to coronavirus prevention. But I do not believe that, that you know, this group was uninformed by reality, nor is it going to change the, the disease characteristics or spread um, um, recommendations that public health would make. Thank you for the insight, Dr. Welch. So we have a motion on the, um, on the floor right now to uh, neither receive nor refer the guidance and instead to provide time for additional deliberation. We have a second on that motion. Um, we could do a roll call or a verbal vote. Um, uh, but yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, this is Caroline. I just feel, I, so I hear you, Superintendent, on, on your motion. I've assumed that everything that's in the guidelines is what the the healthcare experts feel is again the best practices right now as they know it related to the disease so it's not so much for me superintendent challenging those guidelines maybe there's some challenges in how it's implemented maybe there's some challenges around understanding why the number is 50 and not 70 etc it's not the guidelines. What I heard you say, Hannah, answered for me. I'm concerned that you really don't have any authority to tell anyone you have to do it this way. And it goes back to what uh, Patrick Dobard was saying again, is it comes down to districts and what they want to follow and how that's gonna be communicated to their school community. I think I'm just, again, I'm more concerned that really nothing here is a mandate. It is it's just normal. that these are the best practices. And so how are we going to do that? And I'm worried that you are going to have districts and charters 
all over the place in how they implement this. So I'm not sure if deferring is the right thing, but I absolutely want our voices heard on, on that concern, I guess. And I would agree with you, Ms. Romer. I guess what I don't understand then is what is the option Hannah proposed there is the second option. Who's going to do that sort of rewrite and revision? And is there a deliberation that we get to be a part of there? Or is this going to move forward? It's going to be tweaked in some spots here and accepted, and we didn't get a chance to look at it again. So that would. Well, one option would be to reconvene uh, tomorrow or at another time later in the week to review those language changes. But I think what I am understanding to a better extent right now is that if the public health recommendations that are contained within that memo are unlikely to change, what we would be changing is the introductory language um, would contained within those tools, potentially renaming the tools. Although I don't, I don't, you know, I would take recommendations on what we could rename them. That would be, those would be the change to the documents. And we could, rather than voting, we could reconvene tomorrow or at another time this week to review those updates um, or not. That would be your choice. I think, Caroline, your question about enforcement is a question to which I don't have the answer. I know how laws are enforced. I know how regulations are enforced. These public health guidelines that are being issued for every different sector, I don't have a clear sense of, enfor of enforcement. And that's not been my, my personal focus in this exercise. It has been to work with public health officials to develop, um, the, to develop the, basically the operating conditions that need to be met. I think that would be a question probably for the leads of the Resilient Louisiana Commission. It would be instructive to understand how other sectors are thinking about monitoring and enforcement, so to speak, and it potentially could be a question for our, our legal counsel. But just to be very clear, I have, our team has not thought of, really about uh, monitoring and enforcement, so to speak. We've focused on getting baseline operating conditions that really need to be met along with supportive best practice style guidance to help school systems comply. Uh, but, you know, I would take the group's thought on whether or not it would be beneficial to reconvene, to review sort of the updated opening language. Um, I, I forget we have um, a Bessie meeting tomorrow, which is very full with committee meetings and also a full board meeting condensed into one day. So I think it would be potentially difficult for us to meet tomorrow. We could convene on Wednesday. Um, I do think there is a likelihood that the governor will be calling a press conference later this week to um, speak to some of um, these factors associated with reopening. And our goal was to get these as final as possible into the task force's hands and also to get as many superintendents as informed as possible before that press conference. But I, I can't say for sure when that will occur, um, nor can I say what it will, what that press conference will contain. All I know is that it is uh, tentatively on the agenda. So, so we can proceed with a vote on a straight up a deferral for greater deliberation. We could have a substitute motion uh, to uh, receive and refer with contingencies or updated language. We could reconvene uh, at a later time this week to review an updated version of the documents. Hannah, this is Joanne. When is the um the, the formal task force meeting again. Do you have that date? Yes, it's this Friday. So on Wednesday, oh, it's actually Wednesday. So the Education and Workforce Development Task Force meet, will meet on Wednesday. And at that time, that task force will consider a report that has many recommendations uh, contained within it relative to uh, K-12 and post-secondary education, workforce development. It's a group who's focus is much beyond ours. It would also, if you received and referred this guidance, include guidance for uh, K-12 school reopening. It will also include guidance for 
institutions of higher education. Um, and then once the task force receives the report, it will go to the full commission on Friday. And Susanna Craig, I know that you are on the line from Board of Regents. If there's anything, and I know you are um, supporting that task force, if there's anything you would add about the task force um, or about the process for developing guidance for institutions of higher education, please feel free. If not, that's fine as well. Uh, no, I, I mean, I would just add that I, I think intentionally the, the information that's provided to higher ed has been guidance beca because each institution has the authority to make some decisions based on their institution um, and their system. I know that this is a bit different because we're dealing with a younger age group of, of students. However, again, this is um, whether or not we change the name, it is intended to be guidance to use to support planning in school systems. So as school systems are making decisions about um, how they might best open in the fall, the, the intent of the guidance is to support that planning. And um, so, I mean, I would encourage us to, to move forward with this, with the guidance that's been presented, um, knowing full well that the more we learn about the, um, this disease or its ability to be transmitted or not transmitted will be provided to us by the Department of Health. And then we'll make, um, um, changes to the guidance at that point in time, depending on which phase uh, we are in. Um, I know that, uh, I know that the, the, there, there's heavy lift in these guidance. I, I, I understand that. Um, I do wanna speak briefly to um, the concerns about temperature checks and the decision was made to do those temperature checks at school rather than actually at the bus stop because we felt it would be more, um, it would be better for the students to, um, if some parents leave their kids at the bus and then they get a temperature, they have a temperature check and their parents have already gone to work, it might present some um, other concerns. And so I think that's a, a recommendation that the temperature check, the recommendation for a temperature check was going to happen either at the bus stop or at the school site. Um, we, we've presented our higher ed guidance. Um, it's out to all institutions. It's on our website. It's available um, for anyone to take a look at. Um, these, these mirror um, so, some of the same similarities. And so I, I would encourage us to um, be able to submit this guidance so that school systems can start their planning. Uh, that's all, Hannah. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. Hannah, this is um, Patrick Doubleaudi, and maybe I could help. I know I, I don't know if I could take back my second, but if somebody would make a motion, so whatever the Roberts Rule of Order would allow this to happen, I, I have like suggested language that I just kind of wrote, and if you would capture it, Hannah, that might yeah. split the difference between what we have going on, where I think like Susanna's explanation triggered something in my thinking that might be able to split it. So I don't know what the proper protocol is since I made the second to David's uh, motion, but- Oh gosh, Ryan, you're gonna have to help me on that one. <laughs> Sorry to complicate it. And while Ryan is looking that up, if, if, yeah, if you I don't can, mind, I'm I can going get, to in the I chat box. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna just, dic I'm gonna take dictation in the chat okay. so that everyone can see. So I'm looking at, I'm looking at the reopening Louisiana school facilities in 2020, 2021 supportive guidance document that was in our backup. If you go down to the fourth paragraph where it begins the Louisiana Department of Education, LDE, in consultation with the Louisiana Department of Health, offers the following supportive guidance in order to assist schools in, I would say planning instead of adhering because that hearing makes people then say, well, I have to follow this. So if you would change that to assist schools in planning as it relates to public health guidelines and ensuring the health and safety of their students and staff, as well as limiting the spread of COVID-19, period. 
because then that would capture, I think what Susanna was saying, and I appreciate her clarifying that, is that this is to give guidance as it relates to it, not to adhere to. And maybe if we take that out, then, you know, all of the best practices and what the healthcare experts just shared is that the basic things, wearing masks, washing hands, taking temperatures, that won't change a week from now, a day from now. But the nuance of a very complicated situation that we're in will then be able to be handled based off of this guidance, as well as other things that districts will have to just take in consideration. So it's not an adhering to, it's just for them to plan. Very helpful. Uh, thank you. I've noted that in the box that everyone can see it. So that's one change that we would want to see um, as a contingency. Is there any other language or are there any other terminology changes that we would want to see um, as contingencies? Is there any way in any of this we could more clearly uh, expose what is mandated, what's a restriction versus what's guidance? I mean, are there a list of five or six restrictions or five or, you know, what are those things? So, and I, I see Ms. Craig that I, I you know, I, I'm still speaking on behalf of some meetings that we've uh, had with superintendents and that's our concern. And perhaps I'm, I'm in the wrong direction in this group right now. And, and I recognize the fact that what I'm trying to do is we, we want public safety and we all want open schools. And sometimes we want one more than the other. In some of our language, we want one more than we want the other. And so, and then at the end of the day, our families are gonna be driving by our campuses and watching marching bands march together and football players play together if we're in phase three and wonder why their children are wearing masks inside the building. So those are the things that I need some clarity on and all of us do. So, that's where we are. And I apologize that I have belabored that point. I just, David, I, you, there's no need to apologize. The purpose of this group is to hear all opinions. I need to understand. So the memo that comes under the heading of public health is meant to be the baseline, more or less non-negotiable conditions for operating. Anything else is, support, is supportive guidance. If, that, if, if that's not clear, I need help in understanding how to make it clear. I don't know how to. I, d I don't know the words to use or the, or the change to make. And you, you're gonna have to tell me that, tell our team that so we can make the change because I feel like we're sort of in circles on this. Which document is that, Hannah? The, me the public health memo. Department of Public Health uh, from the Louisiana Department of Public Health. So when you, when there's, Loose language in that document that, first of all, elementary and secondary, we've already decided we need to define that better. To the maximum extent possible, that, that, that phrase right there is, is not clear. There's no mandate in that. I, I got to be at six feet to the maximum extent possible. Some of those kind of things make us... Those are the big questions that we've had when we've gathered. Okay, so if we don't say, just to put a very fine point on this, and I apologize for interrupting. If we don't say to the maximum extent possible, then it doesn't give any flexibility. If we say to the maximum extent possible, it does. We can remove to the maximum extent possible, but my, I believe that that is going to hem you in further. So what would you change? Would you specifically, David, want us to remove to the maximum extent possible? Or what, what is the specific change you would want to see made in the same way that Patrick offered up specific language change? That's how we're going to get across the finish line here. If that's what we're trying to do. Great question. To the maximum extent possible, but no less than X number of feet. Dr. Welsh, is there, and, and so understanding that, so you're saying that we should, are you suggesting, David, that we should try to change the number of feet or the capacity requirements as listed here? Well, that particular sentence references feet. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That particular phrase represents number of feet, references a number of feet. We also have to the maximum extent possible listed in the mask section, I believe. Again, well, I, I think... I was 
I think so here you would want us to change, just to be very precise, David. You would say in, in six feet of classroom indoor settings to the maximum extent possible. You would be saying, you're saying, can we change six feet? Is that what you're asking? No, if it's not six feet, is that okay? We're saying to the maximum extent possible, six feet. And so what would you want to see changed specifically? Is there a minimum? Six feet is the, is the minimum, and the, the guideline is to achieve that to the maximum extent possible. And help me understand what the to the maximum extent possible means. I think it, David, this is Ken. I think it me. I would interpret that to mean what I thought the intent of this when we did it was, was six, six feet is the minimum, but to, and it, that's what, that's what your benchmark is. And to the maximum extent possible, if, 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 if your school with 2300 can do five feet five, but, but you're only doing six inches, then you haven't done to the maximum extent possible. You should be doing five feet five. I just, yeah, so I don't, yes. That's my understanding of what the public health officials in our state are recommending here. And if there's a better way we can frame that, I, I, I'm open to that. I'm not sure what, what that is. I thought that's what we were trying to accomplish. Six feet is the goal to the maximum extent possible. If you can only hit four feet with the kids going through the halls with high school kids with masks on, then you're doing it to the maximum extent possible. Yeah, to Ms. Romer's point, I, I don't think that, and, and I like it if you're saying that, look, we're going to be back in the situation though, and if you're okay with this and we're all okay with this, um, the guidance here, it, this, this was supposed to be the non-negotiable the memo to the Department of Health. But even within the memo of the, to the, from the Department of Health, there are, uh, there's some um, lack of clarity as to how to execute that memo. Um, so I can put 32 kids in this classroom and it's okay. I'll put 22 in another one. And so because of the course request, I was only able to achieve four feet spacing in this classroom, but in another one, I was able to achieve six, and you're saying that's okay. Then I'm good with that if you're saying that's okay. Okay, I don't, so here's, here's my um, take at this point in the conversation. Um, we um, need to close this meeting out because most folks on the phone um, thought it would be ending earlier, um, and we have the medical professionals on the call who need to move on to their next meetings. I'm still not clear, David, on what specific language we would change. However, I do have, and if, if you have something to offer, I would be glad to document it and make that change. I have a, um, I do have a clear language change from Patrick Dobard relative to the supportive guidance. Are there any other specific language changes that people would propose? And then I'd like to ask the group to vote on whether or not to receive and refer the guidance contingent on these language changes to the K-12 task force. So I'd like to entertain any further specific actual line edits to the documents. Is there a motion that we could uh, entertain to receive and refer the guidance documents with the contingent, with the language developed here, contingent on making those changes. Yeah, this is Ryan. I believe Patrick made that motion. We just need a second. Oh, okay, motion. great. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. I'll second that. That's Ashley. The Johnson seconds. In favor, can you please say aye. So in favor right. of receiving and referring with contingent on these changes. Aye. 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 And um, actually, and then how about nays? And then we can decide if we need a roll call. Yeah, is there any opposition to this motion on the floor? Thanks, Ryan. Backyards. This is where we find the shelter.
shared experience. Any opposition. Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to update the documents with uh, the edit that you see here. They will go to uh, the Resilient Louisiana Commission's uh, Education and Workforce Development Task Force. I will copy you on the documents that you see them as they are going to that group. Um, and they will then go to the Resilient Louisiana Commission on Friday as part of that report. Um, I, you know, I want to say this um, in closing. Uh, I was a teacher, a seventh grade teacher. I had a class load of 150 students um, and have worked in school systems most of my adult life. And I do appreciate the incredible challenges associated with implementing these. I also know folks who have become very ill um, and passed away from this disease. And it's just an unprecedented time that is requiring all of us to adapt and respond in ways that we would have never guessed. And I appreciate the dialogue, um, as frustrating as it can be. I think it helps us get better at what we do and helps us implement in the most responsible way possible. I am particularly grateful for the public health officials in the state, for Dr. Welsh, and Dr. Finger, and many others who have spent out hours and hours of their time working with us to develop these recommendations, which um, are complex. And I think we all have children's um, I think we all have our students' needs in our heart, and I appreciate your willingness to engage so deeply on these issues. I do think that we will be calling this group back together in the near term, um, and um, I look forward to reconvening with folks when, when that occurs. Um, and again, if you have um, questions between now and when um, I send this guidance on to the uh, task force, which will be probably in the next uh, 12 hours or so, please email or call me, direct me directly, um, and additionally, um, look for the next opportunity for us. Any, um, actually, Ryan, before we close, any public comment that came in? Ryan, do we have any public comment? Uh, no, I haven't received any. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I will be in touch um, in the coming day or so. I appreciate your engagement. Please um, reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you.